Look around you. So much of our modern world is new. New ideas, new buildings, new narratives. And that's great. Change is necessary for progress. The whole world gets it. So how is it possible that despite all this progress, we still learn in the exact same way our grandparents did? Our education is evolving so slowly. But why? What if your education could evolve and improve as quickly as the world around us does? What if your education was designed to help you discover who you really are? If students were created like co-creators instead of just products? If there was a space meant to build connections between teachers and students? A place where safe space doesn't mean you'll be shielded by censorship. Where liberty isn't just what you learn, but how. Your education should keep up with the rest of the world. And now, it can. Good afternoon to you all. In the name of the Henry Hazlitt Center, I welcome you to the UFM talk, Could Spider-Man Afford to Live in New York? In this conference, we seek to analyze the real estate market and the effects that government regulations have on housing affordability. As speakers, we have Nolan Gray and Olaf Dirkmat. Nolan is a PhD student in city planning at the University of California in LA. Gray earned a Master of City and Regional Planning degree at Rutgers University and received BAs in both philosophy and political science from the University of Kentucky. He was a research fellow in the Urbanity Project at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. His research focuses on land use regulation, housing affordability, and urban design. Nolan will talk about housing policies, supply and demand, and using New York and Spider-Man as examples. Olaf is an economics professor at the, U at the Business School of Francisco Marroquin University and VP of UFM Market Trends one of the region's leading business cycle observatories in which Olaf has written extensively about the housing market in Guatemala. He was VP at NXchange and Gold Republic. He holds a PhD in economics at the Rey Juan Carlos University in Madrid, and he has a master in Austrian economics from the same university, as well as a master in marketing from, from VU University in Amsterdam. Olaf will talk about housing policies, supply and demand, using Guatemala as an example. To introduce the topic, let's watch Nolan's video, The Amazing Housing Politics of Spider-Man, Pop Culture Urbanism, Episode 1. Who am I? Are you sure you want to know? The story of my life is not for the faint of heart. If you thought this was a happy little YouTube video, if somebody told you I was just your average ordinary urbanist with not a care in the world, somebody lied. But let me assure you, this, like any story we're telling, is about a city. That city. New York City. The city I loved since before I even liked cities. I'd like to tell you that's me running this metropolis, building more housing, investing in infrastructure. Heck, I'd even take him. That's me. Hi, I'm Nolan Gray, and this is Pop Culture Urbanism, where we discuss the city planning, real and fictional, behind popular movies, TV shows, games, and more. This episode, let's talk about Amazing Spider-Man. He's a uniquely urban superhero. You can look up at the towers of Manhattan and imagine him swinging from building to building. Speaking of New York, I was actually a city planner myself there, specifically in Queens, which is actually where Peter Parker lives, the Forest Hills neighborhood, that is. Of course, there are many versions of Spider-Man. For this episode, I'll be talking mainly about the Sam Raimi trilogy, the trilogy. Regardless, Spider-Man at his core is about looking out for the little guy, because in many ways, he is the little guy. A teenager who's got mood swings and money problems. He's not great with the ladies, and when he is in a relationship, He's got problems there, too. No. Please. In other words, he's a little bit like all of us, and if you've ever lived in New York, you can probably relate. Rent, the cost of living, money problems, there's nothing more New York than struggling to make it by. Rent! Hi. 
As you may know, New York City is America's most expensive city to live in. The average rent is over $3,000 a month, and the median home price is around $650,000 and growing. Compare that to the national medium of around $250,000. The only time it doesn't get more expensive is when things get really bad, such as when a supervillain destroys the city, or when they decide to close down the subway, or, you know, during a global pandemic. Economic factors play a big role in Sam Raimi's early 2000s trilogy. Uncle Ben and Aunt May are depicted still paying off their mortgage, uh, even though they're old and nearing retirement. In 2019, their house was actually assessed at around $850,000. That would mean a monthly payment of $3,250, assuming they made a 20% down payment, which would be about $100. $160,000. Combined, Uncle Ben and Aunt May would have to make around $130,000 a year for this to be affordable. That puts them well above the uh, New York City median income. If that was tough for a senior electrician like Uncle Ben, that'd be nearly impossible for a retired widow like Aunt May. That's the Social Security. Yes, I see. My Uncle Ben's life insurance. Yes, but I'm afraid it's just not sufficient to refinance your home. Oh, but... I'm giving piano lessons again. You are? If that's all Aunt May has, assuming a regular Social Security payout, maybe a little bit of money from Uncle Ben's death, and, you know, some piano lessons on the side, she really only has about $1,000 to spend on rent. And that's going to be tough in New York City, to say nothing of Forest Hills, which is one of the more expensive rental markets. Now, what are her options? Of course, she could become, you know, a supervillain. Or she could enter a low-odds lottery for one of the city's few below-market units. In 2018, 4.5 million people applied for these units, so she really only has about a 1 in 600 chance of getting getting one. The alternative is to go on the waiting list for senior public housing, but that's also a long shot. While Spider-Man can easily stop bank robbers, he can't stop the bank from repossessing Aunt May's home. These frustrations are an important part of Parker's decision to give up being Spider-Man in the second film, where being a superhero demands that he save others, but it keeps him from being there for the people he loves. Of course, senior widows aren't the only ones facing high rents in New York City. What about a college student like Peter Parker? In the first movie, Parker and his best friend Harry Osborn get an apartment together in Greenwich Village with the help of Harry's father, Norman Osborn. My father got the place in New York, so we're all set this fall. Yeah. Oh, that's great. You know, CEO of Oscorp, Norman Osborn. The principal supplier to the United States military. Which might sound a little insane, but when you remember Greenwich Village, the rents can go anywhere from $5,000 to $8,000. A landlord's going to make you show that you make 40 to 80 times the monthly rent, and then of course you have things like broker's fees and a, a one-month deposit. Peter Parker on his freelance photography job and pizza delivery work just can't hack it. Pizza time. On his own, Peter Parker invariably lives in a dump and struggles to make rent. In the second film in the trilogy, he lives in an SRO, which is short for Single Room Occupancy. This combines a private bedroom with a shared kitchen and bathroom. As Paul Grott documents in his book Living Downtown, SROs were once a major source of affordable housing all the way up through the 1950s when they made up 10% of New York City's rental housing stock. But today, anyone who has tried to make it in New York City knows renting won't come cheap. Students looking for an apartment in Lower Manhattan can expect a lease to be anywhere between twenty-five and 4500 a month easily. Rent? Okay. Well, please, to the public with us, if you have any questions, write them in the Facebook post related to this conference. So let's begin the discussion with Nolan. Okay, so um, first of all, it's a real pleasure uh, to be speaking to you all today. Um, I would give it in Spanish, uh, but you don't wanna hear me give this talk in Spanish. <laughs> At least not until I get a little more practice. Um, but it's a real pleasure. I'm, I'm, I'm a friend of UFM and it's, it's an honor and pleasure to be speaking to you all today. So I'm speaking about something very serious today, the amazing housing politics of Spider-Man. I'm gonna cover a little bit of territory uh, covered in the video. But then we're going to talk about maybe some constructive solutions and, and broader implications. So let's jump right into it. So as has already been discussed, um, that's me back when I had a mustache. Uh, I'm a professional city planner. And for a period, I was a city planner actually in New York City, uh, including specifically in Queens. And, you know, I got interested in, in Spider-Man, uh, you know, on, on a few levels. I've always loved Spider-Man, um, not for his housing politics. Uh, but Spider-Man is interesting to the extent that uh, he's a uniquely urban superhero. You read the comics or you watch the movies, and uh, he's uniquely associated with an actual physical place, New York City. And this is something that you see in a lot of, of Marvel products. Uh, but Spider-Man is especially unique in that he, his superpowers literally depend on there being tall buildings. Uh, but as I mentioned, I, I got doubly interested in Spider-Man because he's from Forest Hills. And um, when I applied to be a city planner in New York City, it just so happened that I was assigned to the 
neighborhood where uh, Peter Parker's actually supposed to be from. It's a neighborhood called Forest Hills uh, in Central Queens. And, you know, the house that they film him in, being in the, the early 2000s or the Sam Raimi trilogy, that's the trilogy with Tobey Maguire, uh, the house was actually in uh, the district. And I would sometimes joke with my colleagues that we would try to put it under a historic uh, preservation ordinance. Um, they didn't take to it. But let's talk about the broader context here. So New York City, Manhattan specifically, is one of the most expensive places to live uh, in the United States, other than Honolulu, uh, which faces some unique circumstances being on an island in the middle of the Pacific. Um, it's even more expensive than San Francisco, which is often you know, correctly appreciated as an incredibly expensive place. And even outside of Manhattan, a lot of the outer boroughs are, are certainly not cheap. Of course, Brooklyn is quite expensive, uh, and so is Queens, which is where Peter Parker is from. Um, citywide, the citywide rent as of May 2020 was about $3,500. Uh, the uh, median home price was about $650,000. Uh, compared to the national average of about 250,000. And, you know, these are pretty dire numbers. Uh, even though the coronavirus is likely to reduce um, the, you know, rents in the near future, vacancies are pretty high, as a lot of people have left Manhattan in particular. Um, this likely is not something that's going to change in the near future. People are going to continue to have a lot of demand uh, to live in Manhattan. So this is a problem that has been around for decades and is probably going to continue to be around for decades. Um, so first, I, I want to I want to clear something up here. Um, in this talk, I mainly talk about the the trilogy from the early two thousands uh, with Tobey Maguire. Uh, so this is, of course, a uh, nice old lady Aunt May. Um, I'm not talking about the the recent Marvel Cinematic Universe movies with uh, sexy young Aunt May. Um, don't have any problems with her, uh, but there's more housing content in the earlier. Uh, films. And really, it, there's a lot of housing content just in the original comics. I mean, housing comes up in both of these renditions of the character, but uh, I'm focusing on the, the earlier trilogy. So let's talk about Uncle Ben and Aunt May's house. Um, so, you know, when I'm trying to learn my neighborhood, I've just been assigned to Queens, I've just been assigned to Forest Hills, I'm trying to learn more about the neighborhood. Just on a whim, I decide to look up the price of what Uncle Ben and Aunt May's house would be. And, and this is interesting because, you know, in the movies, they're presented as a very working class, very, um, you know, typical household. Well, their house in 2019 actually sold for $850,000. Uh, the assessment uh, as of, you know, I think 2019, 2020 was something closer to $900,000. Um, at the rate things are going, this house is going to be well over a million dollars in a few years. Uh, but let's just go with that $850,000 price point. Um, this would entail a monthly mortgage payment of $3,250. And that's assuming that Aunt May and Uncle Ben made a 20% down payment, uh, which would be, you know, just a paltry $160,000. Um, to make all this affordable, Uncle Ben and Aunt May would have had to have a household income of $130,000. Um, for context, the median household income in New York is about $65,000. So they would have had to be twice as wealthy as the typical New York City household. And we're not really led to believe that that's the case. I mean, Uncle Ben is a retired electrician. Uh, Aunt May seems to have been a homemaker. Um, so this is really bad, right? So I, spoiler alert, Uncle Ben dies. Um, if you didn't know that, I'm sorry, but you shouldn't have tuned in for a housing politics of Spider-Man. Uncle Ben passes away. Aunt May is in this very difficult situation. They seem to still be paying off their house. And what ends up happening is, of course, being a retired widow, she has a lot of trouble with it. So what would Aunt May's finances look like? She would look much more like a typical New Yorker, actually. Um, let's assume she's making $1,500 a month on Social Security. Maybe she's getting $1,000 from deceased spouse benefit. Um, maybe she's still getting some of Uncle Ben's pension. Uh, and then, of course, the piano lessons that she surprised them with. Um, she really only has about $1,000 to spend on rent. Um, so there's really no chance that she could afford even a very modest, you know, unremarkable house uh, in Queens. And she's going to struggle to get even a decent apartment uh, in New York City. So what are her options? Um, she could, of course, be a supervillain. Um, uh, here's her attacking Dr. Octopus. Uh, probably not a likely scenario. Uh, or she could um, apply for one of the city's subsidized units. Um, 
Unfortunately, in 2018, there were nearly 5 million applications for these units. She would have a 1 in 600 chance of actually getting one. Um, and then other than that, she could apply for senior public housing. Uh, but there, the waiting list is almost 11 years. So she, she should keep praying if that's going to be the strategy. Um, in all likelihood, she's not going to be able to stay in her neighborhood if she can stay in New York City at all. So the natural sort of result of all this is uh, Aunt May is foreclosed on. Um, and, you know, when we talk about the housing politics of Spider-Man, something I think that's really neat about the, the earlier trilogy and a lot of the comics is that this really takes a toll on Peter Parker. I mean, this is key in his decision to actually give up being Spider-Man. He can stop bank robbers from robbing the bank, but he can't stop the bank from foreclosing on his aunt when she can't make the mortgage payments. But so, you know, let's set aside a uh, retired widow for just a moment. Um, what about a young high school graduate college student, Peter Parker, right? Um, he's ambitious and smart. He should be able to hack it uh, in the city. Well, um, what he ends up doing is living with Harry Osborn, who is the, you know, the heir of uh, uh, Norman Osborn's incredible fortune as a military supplier. They end up living in Greenwich Village. Um, a neighborhood where rents can go five thousand to eight thousand dollars a month. Um, you know, when you try to get into one of these units, the broker is going to ask that you show that your income is forty to eighty times the rent. There's going to be a pretty hefty broker's fee, and there's probably going to be a one month deposit. Um, all of this is to say, there's absolutely no way that Peter could live in a situation like this uh, without Harry's uh, support. So that becomes a problem at the end of the first movie when Peter Parker kills Harry Osborn's dad uh, and naturally they stop living together and Peter Parker only really has two sources of income. He delivers pizzas uh, and he's a photographer. So on his own, what he ends up doing is he lives in a single room occupancy. Um, these are quite common or they were quite common at one point in a lot of American cities. It's essentially one room apartment. You have a, a bed uh, and a little kitchenette. Then you'll have a shared bathroom Sometimes there's a, a shared larger kitchen, uh, but it's a very frugal, very affordable lifestyle. Um, you know, just to expand it a little bit beyond the movies, here is uh, Peter Parker's uh, SRO in the, the PlayStation 4 game that just came out. Um, incredibly messy. And something I'm seeing here too is you see the window unit for the AC, you see the steam heat. These are not things that I miss, but they're a normal part of life in New York City. Um, so SROs at one point were about 10% of the city's rental stock. There were over uh, 200,000 um, in New York City alone. Um, and, you know, these are not glamorous uh, by any means. You know, here's the scene in Spider-Man 2 where his, uh, his landlord's cutting him off in line for the bathroom because he still hasn't paid his rent. Um, but they are a really essential source of, of affordable housing at the bottom of the market. You know, otherwise in Manhattan, even if you're not looking at a place like Greenwich Village, which is exceptionally expensive, rents are still going to range anywhere from about $2,500 to $4,500 a month. Um, needless to say, this is not something that a pizza delivery boy slash photographer slash college student can be able to afford. So why does living in New York City cost so much? I mean, Peter Parker, Aunt May, they, they aren't the first retired widow uh, or college student to try to live in New York City. Um, but the simple answer is that the city just doesn't allow enough housing to be built to accommodate the demand. Um, so let's go kind of deep into the weeds here for just a minute on the housing economics. Uh, housing prices uh, and supply are a function of two things, supply and demand. So of course there's a demand, how many people want to live in a given neighborhood at a given location at a certain quality of housing. Um, then there's the supply, uh, which is the sort of ability of, of landlords to take maybe something like a vacant lot uh, or an existing home uh, and either add more housing or, you know, build, build an entirely new building on it. Um, and really the heart of the problem in a place like New York City is that New York City just doesn't allow enough housing to be built. I mean, over the past 20 years, there's been an explosive comeback for the city and a lot of people want to live in New York City. And, you know, there's questions about how the coronavirus are going to affect that. You know, we'll see. I think there's always going to be things that drive people to New York City. Um, but in the long term, this is going to remain a pretty serious issue, and the city has to allow more housing. Um, so here's a fantastic graphic. So why is it so hard to build new housing in New York City? What are the mechanisms by which a city like New York, like a lot of American cities, uh, stops new housing from being built? 
So this is a map of Queens, uh, Peter Parker's borough, and the red are areas where the zoning will not allow anything more than low density residential. Um, so this means in many cases, nothing more than a single family home, uh, nothing more than a duplex, nothing more than two or three stories high. This is a pretty large share of the borough where even if you wanted to come in and build an apartment building, there was incredible demand. Um, you know, a bank would give you a loan. Uh, you had the construction crews all ready to go. The city would just say flat out, no, you can't build housing here. So that's a little bit of a problem. There just aren't going to be as many apartments for people like Aunt May and Peter Parker because there's just a very, very limited supply of new apartments being built. Um, and, and really kind of funny enough, when I was kind of playing around being totally distracted at work, reading about Spider-Man and the housing issues, um, I discovered that actually Forest Hills, the neighborhood where Peter Parker lives here, it's in the center of this graphic, was actually down zoned uh, in 2007. That means that the city reduced what was allowed there. And part of what they were doing was actually uh, making it harder to build apartments or, or just banning them outright in many parts of the neighborhood. Um, so the irony here is that, you know, very shortly after the, the trilogy that I'm talking about comes out, the city actually changes the law to make it even harder to build apartments that would accommodate people like Aunt May and Peter Parker in the neighborhood that they live in. Um, SROs. I mentioned SROs. They're not glamorous, but they're a really essential source of affordable housing in the city. And to the extent that they're still around, um, they remain you know, a pretty important part of the housing market, right? So here's Peter Parker, who otherwise would never be able to afford to live in Manhattan. He lives in a dumpy SRO. And in this scene, of course, he pulls the... the um, the uh, handle just straight out of the door. It's not glamorous, but it's your ticket into the city. Well, in 1955, New York City actually banned SROs. Uh, they were seen as poor people's housing, undesirable for a, for a modern and upwardly mobile city. So they were just banned outright. Um, and, and, you know, worse yet, uh, in the 70s and 80s, the city actually goes on to start giving tax breaks to landlords to take their SROs and convert them uh, into expensive co-ops or condos. Uh, so, you know, in the 70s, you're at, at a rate of about 40 SRO buildings a year with with strong government subsidies. You know, landlords are responding to the incentives presented to them by the local government, and they're basically turning their SROs into luxury housing. Um, so this is, you know, not good if you're someone like Peter Parker. You, you can't afford one of these luxury apartments, but you might be able to afford an SRO. And then there's uh, floor area ratio. So, you know, this is a wonky way of basically referring to density limits within cities. So the way cities regulate density uh, is they say, well, you can build so much floor area and it has to be a given ratio uh, of the lot area. Um, so in New York State, you can't build more than 12. And in vast parts of New York City, you can't build more than uh, one or two uh, FAR. So very, very short buildings. And so as a result of all of these policies, um, people bid up the price of housing. And the people who already live in New York City, uh, in many cases can be displaced uh, because they can't afford the higher rents. So here's Rio and Miles Morales, a newer rendition of the character. They deal with similar pressures. And so in all of the movies and all of the comics, Peter Parker and Aunt May do a lot of homelessness outreach, You know, presumably a result of their feeling, you know, the housing affordability crunch themselves. But you know, they can only do so much. It's really going to come down to everyday New Yorkers. So. Here are the three amazing ways that you can help Aunt May and Peter Parker. Uh, the first is what are called accessory dwelling units, legalizing them. Uh, so these are extra apartments that go in unused garages or attics or bedrooms. Um, and this has a few benefits. On the one hand, it creates affordable units. So that garage that's turned into an apartment can now be an affordable unit for someone like Peter Parker. Uh, and that garage also creates a new income stream for that homeowner, which might help to keep them in their home. Uh, the, the second is to just remove floor area limits. So there's, these are really just an arbitrary limit on the amount of new housing supply that can be built. Uh, and they're really kind of indefensible, especially in cases where the housing would serve uh, vulnerable populations. Uh, and then the third is get rid of low density zoning. Um, so, you know, as I pointed out with Queens, vast sections of the city are completely restricted to low density housing. Um, and this makes it very hard to add the kind of housing that, you know, people at the margins really, really need. Um, and then kind of as a fringe benefit, uh, Spider-Man just to swing around the city needs tall buildings. Now, so 
we have a housing crisis. We're mainly talking about people like Peter Parker, not me. But but really, the the benefit of building more housing in a place like New York isn't just uh, lifting up a few people. Um, you know, the idea is to create a housing market where all different kinds of people from all different walks of life uh, can afford the city. Be they you know scientists, uh, scientists or uh, musicians uh, or you know working families um, or um, musicians, and of course superheroes. Not that Tony Stark um, needs our help. But, uh, you know, a few more Stark Towers probably wouldn't hurt New York City. And I've mostly talked about New York here, but I want to emphasize that this is a nationwide and, and really an international problem. Um, you know, the amount of money that people are forced to spend on their housing is going up almost everywhere. And this is really largely a function of a regulatory driven scarcity. Um, you know, at the end of the day, the power to control how much housing is built in a city is a great responsibility and with great responsibility, or great power comes great responsibility. Kind of botched it, but you guys know the same. Um, it's been a real pleasure talking to you all. If you're interested in more of this, we have a whole series on um, pop culture urbanism. We have two other videos already out. We have videos on Avatar, The Last Airbender. Uh, some of you might be watching on a Netflix. And we have a, a video on the evil developer trope. We have a few more videos actually coming out later this year, which we're really excited about. So uh, head on over to YouTube and subscribe to that. And then um, I'm on Twitter. Uh, I, you know, I'm always tweeting about this stuff, uh, Spider-Man, uh, housing politics, and I'd love for you to come be a part of the conversation. So thanks so much. Thank you very much, Nolan. Uh, let's continue the discussion with Ola. Okay. So, uh, a lot of uh, great information by Nolan. We will, we'll see, uh, how the, how this relates all to, to Guatemala. Uh, there's a few uh, special things that even though the regulations are very much similar in Guatemala, there's a few peculiarities that might uh, uh, might uh, be very interesting for any uh, outside observer in Guatemala. So uh, just let me uh, go ahead and, and then let's go through these five issues, current issues in the Guatemalan housing market. Um, okay, first of all, there's a lot of uh, uh, political pressure to uh, introduce new laws in, in Guatemala, especially with regard to affordable housing. The idea is simple. Uh, there's not enough affordable housing. There's a lot of people actually living in uh, shelters that that cannot be really considered truly uh, truly housing. Uh, that is, there's a, a qualitative deficit of good quality housing. Many houses in the rural parts of Guatemala don't even have a hard floor. So um, there's a very much emphasis in these policies, or there's a justification, which is that a lot of people in Guatemala do not have housing, and therefore the government has to step in and fix this through, for instance, subsidies. One of these subsidies that that, that are currently proposed is uh, is embodied in a law that's called the Ley or the Ley de Tasa de Interés Preferencial. This is basically a, 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 a subsidized interest rate for buyers, which would allow for for them to buy more expensive housing than would have been possible with a higher interest rate. So. Uh, in reality, what happens is that banks make mortgage loans to uh, borrowers. Then the borrower, of course, buys their home with their with the borrowed money. Uh, in this case, uh, basically, what we are saying is that the government is trying to stimulate uh, uh, bank lending to these type of mortgages. So what we'll see is is, is the following. The, the mechanism is not that important. In this case, the banks pay less in taxes. There's a tax incentive if they lend to these families and uh, uh, offer a lower interest rate. They can basically uh, uh, get a tax credit for the for half of the of the interest rate. But in, in fact, for the buyer at least, this is a clear subsidy. So what happens with the subsidy? Well, that's very interesting to uh, analyze. The argument, the typical argument is that this will first create more housing supply and uh, uh, increase access accessibility by great parts of the Guatemalan population that can now buy a home with a subsidized interest rate. However, this is not the whole story. In fact, if we uh, take a typical uh, economics textbook, what we'll see is that it very much depends on what is called the elasticity of the housing supply. So Nolan a, a couple of times mentioned uh, regulations. There's a lot of regulations in place. There's in, in most cities a, a license system which could artificially reduce the housing supply, making the housing supply very inelastic. That is, if demand goes up for housing, there's not a lot of new construction to match the new increase in demand. 
So uh, that's actually actually exactly what happens in in Guatemala for multiple reasons. One of them are licenses, which we'll discuss in the second point. But if we look at this graph, we'll have uh, two demand curves, which are basically right there, and the second demand curve D two has basically included um, has included. Uh, has included subsidy. So what basically happens is, if we, I'm not going to show all the graphs, but what basically happens is that most of the surplus, which is created by the subsidy, will go not to the buyers of the house of the housing, but of the producers of housing. It is a constru construction and development and, and develop real estate developers in Guatemala. So what we'll see is that if the housing supply is inelastic, if not much more housing will be constructed, even though. Uh, we subsidize uh, interest rates for buyers, uh, then uh, what will happen is that merely the existing housing uh, supply will be bid up because more people have uh, monetary power to bid up those prices. And therefore, the prices that developers can charge for the new construction is, is much higher. So in other words, uh, this is one of the, of the uh, uh, maybe... Uh, it's a little bit cheating, no? It's a little bit cheating, cheating in the sense that they sell this as a, a great policy to improve housing affordability, but in fact, uh, it will only push up housing prices at the benefit or for the benefit of housing developers. Uh, the second factor are construction licenses. So we've talked about New York. Well, one of the differences between emerging markets and in this case, New York, emerging markets such as Guatemala City, is that simply uh, time as a higher cost. We all know the famous saying, time is money. Well, in this case, it means that in emerging markets, time is even more costly than in developed markets. So in this case, if it takes one or two years to get all the necessary permits and licenses, this is a very large cost, especially in emerging markets, which will la later be uh, uh, um, uh, transferred to housing, uh, well, owners as well as renters. So in this case, if we look at affordability, we could see that licenses and especially long delays in giving uh, uh, construction uh, permits, it could really reduce the affordability of housing and push up prices, even though nobody really relates cost and effect. So uh, in what, what happens in most cases is that the free market is getting the blame for whatever uh, delays construction licenses are, are causing. So if the typical uh, uh, real estate development in Guatemala City would take from three to five years. And uh, there has been a lot of delays with licenses. They're trying to fix it right now. But uh, if, if we see this, we can uh, see that one of the consequences is no affordable housing or very little affordable housing. And that then, of course, the market is blamed. They call it a market failure. Uh, but in reality, all the, uh, the problems or most of the problems are caused by the construction licenses policies. Uh, the third factor is uh, our zoning laws. So zoning laws, uh, we, we've seen it uh, with, uh, uh, with Nolan. He, uh, he mentioned floor area ratios in New York. Well, we have something very similar in Guatemala. If we take a map of Guatemala City, we can see that some zones and some streets and some lots are actually allowed to build much more what we call in the New York floor area ratio, which means that basically in some areas of the city, you can buy, you can con you can uh, construct or build just a few levels, maybe one or two or three levels at tops. And then you have other parts of the city where you're actually allowed to uh, build up to 10, 15, 20 levels. But in, a in any case, these are clear limits to construction and building more affordable housing units. If we can only uh, uh, build up to three or four levels, it might very well be possible that this buying this, this lot and turning it into a multiple housing units is not profitable. So that will actually uh, uh, reduce in the long term the, the, the much needed housing supply, no? However, there's a, a special factor in Guatemala because if you look at the way the, the zoning laws are actually designed, is that they took the, the most, um, the main streets of the city where most traffic uh, passes as well, the arteries of the city, they, they, we, we might call them, and these main streets or the lots adjacent to these main streets are actually allowed to build much higher. So what we'll see is a lot of uh, 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 skyscrapers or at least higher buildings, anywhere between 10, 15, but even 30 levels uh, next to main streets 
which actually has a very uh, uh, a negative consequence. So in this case, well, first of all, affordable housing again, no, because clearly the supply of housing units is being limited by the amount of square meters that a developer might construct according to the regulation a, on a given lot. So first of all, this will lead to what people think is a market failure is basically a, 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 a failure of uh, private developers to, uh, to build the necessary affordable housing units, which then of course uh, requir requires, uh, well, additional um, uh, construction, uh, maybe by the state, either through subsidized loans, guarantee, uh, loan guarantees, as subsidies to buyers or whatever tax breaks or benefits they could think of. Uh, however, these issues with housing supply are always, well, in this case, caused by uh, zoning laws. So if we look at this street, this is an artery in, in, in uh, Guatemala City, very close to the university. This is uh, zone 10. This is La, La Diagonal 6. And we have uh, here one of the main streets in Guatemala. A lot of cars pass here every day. And it has been a, a very difficult point in terms of traffic. So in this case, maybe for one kilometer, you could easily take two, two to three hours in peak uh, traffic, especially before COVID. Now it's a little bit easier. If you look at the buildings around this artery, you can see that two buildings are straight on this main street. So there's actually incentives due to the zoning laws to build uh, uh, very dense buildings next to very uh, uh, traffic intense streets, main streets, which only uh, uh, um, uh, exert the, uh, make it more difficult or, or add to the already uh, uh, traf to the to the traffic problem that already exists. In other words, uh, the traffic flow is clearly interrupted because they built straight to the street. And if you go uh, from, if you leave the building or you enter the building, you clearly have to break and then you have to uh, uh, enter, of course, the, the main street, which then, uh, uh, well, it will lead to breaking and then, well, the traffic flow is interrupted and you get traffic jams, no? So we see a lot of these buildings. I'm pretty sure you might recognize multiple buildings at the diagonal size, which are currently built. And it will only add to the traffic jams that already uh, have been uh, affecting Guatemala City. Um, so reduce traffic flow, more traffic jams. Uh, another thing which is in the zoning laws, and this is very classical, uh, I, I'm pretty sure even Robert can tell us a lot about, about this. Any, uh, any student of urbanism uh, knows Jane Jacobs, and Jane Jacobs has a lot of theories, but one of the, the theories she had was the, 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 the principle of ice on the streets. So uh, neighborhoods would be more secure, would be safer if you have ice on the street, which means basically that you have to uh, have multiple uses in, 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 in buildings. That is, you have, you have to mix residential uh, housing with uh, commerce, with stores, uh, supermarkets, etc., and you have to mix them. You know? So in, in one neighborhood, you would find offices, you would find uh, commerce, you would find uh, residential buildings and all mixed because during the day, for instance, stores are open, so they will have eyes on the streets. And at nighttime, while well, people live there, so they'll have eyes on the street, making it all uh, all around a more safer place to exist. Well, there's a few uh, incentives in the housing, in the zoning laws in Guatemala, which means that, uh, for instance, if you have glass uh, on the first level of your building, glass around, uh, making it more transparent, right? Because you can see from within the building to the outside of the building, which is basically the principle of ice on the streets by Jane Jacobs. But what we really see is that if we offer these incentives, which are basically incentives so you can uh, sell and build more square meters on the same lot, right? Uh, if you have glass uh, windows on the first level, what really happens is that uh, constructors and, and developers will try to optimize according to the regulation. So they'll not even consider the usefulness of, uh, I don't know, maybe stores or, or glass uh, walls. They'll just put up whatever the regulation requires to be able to get the tax, or the in this case, the square meter incentive to build. In other words, uh, uh, the, uh, constructors and developers are not really thinking about the usability and uh, the quality of life 
when they do, do these type of things. And if you go around to the city, you actually see a few examples of this, of developers trying to optimize totally rationally according to the zoning laws implemented by the city council. Four, which is basically what the, the, the majority of my work has been in the Guatemalan housing market. Well, the main difference with, uh, with the US, for instance, is that it's a lot of retail investment in rental units. Uh, in the US, it's very different. Rental administrators are often uh, companies with, backed with institutional money. So what happens if you have a real estate development, development and maybe the administrator or, or the, the, the real estate company might buy all units, all rental units in a building and then basically for years and years and years uh, dedicate themselves to the business of renting the rental units and of course keeping up uh, occupancy rates. So in this case, in Guatemala is very different. You have lots of retail investment, lots of, lots of people who buy one or two or three apartments and then put it at, up as, as rental units without uh, much knowledge about the market, uh, which makes, makes it a very difficult market uh, uh, for, for instance, prices to adjust. So what we'll see in Guatemala is that, uh, in, uh, uh, contrary to what happens in the US, the, uh, the rentals, the rent, the, the rent price, it barely moves in Guatemala, right? But in the US, it, it adjusts very quickly. That is, if there's a lot of uh, uh, occupancy or, or, or uh, there's a lot of a vacancy, right? There's a lot of vacancy right now because of COVID-19 in New York. So what variable will move then? Well, they will basically lower rental prices so people move in and they fill up again the buildings, not in the rental units. Well, that doesn't happen that quickly in, in, in Guatemala. What really happens is that uh, vacancy rates go up, go up, go up without price adjusting. So the, 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 the result of having lots of retail investors getting into the rental business is that prices barely adjust or very slowly adjust. And the variable that really moves and, and, and fluctuates are actually vacancy rates. No, uh, this would basically, uh, this is what say, the sheet says, so rigid prices would be a rigid, uh, Rent prices, no, so rental prices barely uh, move, but also it leads to overvaluation. That is, uh, uh, home purchase prices are very high in Guatemala uh, uh, compared to rents, compared to other similar cities, uh, but also compared to uh, especially the, the income, the median income of, of Guatemalans. And uh, in general, we see it, these purchases and these retail investors disregarding any metric, rational metric of profitability. And uh, we might see that one of the, cons the negative consequences of this is that, well, we have savings. We have a few savings we have in Guatemala. We will squander them basically in, in real estate investment in bricks. And uh, that will uh, involve a destruction of savings if and when housing prices will fall. In, in one point, uh, either variable, either rental prices or home prices must move and probably it's gonna be home prices that are gonna readjust downward. So um, uh, this is of course, one of the, 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 the particular details of the Guatemalan housing markets, housing market. And last but not least, uh, government mortgage guarantees, very popular, not only in Guatemala, but also in other uh, parts of, uh, of the world. And uh, it's basically based or justified with the same argument of market failure. So basically what they, the, what they will say is, well, private sector doesn't, bu doesn't build enough affordable housing units. Uh, this is a uh, cost because banks do not lend enough money to uh, uh, lower so socioeconomic classes. So in this case, uh, to the poor, and uh, therefore the government must step in and must assure that also the poor will receive enough mortgage credit to buy housing, no? And well, the most, uh, most typical cures are loan guarantees, tax incentives, and direct subsidies. Uh, if we read uh, Economics in One Lesson, which is a great book by uh, Henry Hassett, we will see that this means necessarily that uh, uh, more bad loans will be made 
then in the absence of the policy, then in the absence of the, the, the mortgage guarantees, the state mortgage guarantees. And this all comes at the, cost, at the cost of a taxpayer, although it's very difficult to recognize the cost as a taxpayer of these failing policies. And it also comes at the cost of economic growth. Now, there will be a destruction of capital. There will be destruction of savings. Banks are intermediaries of savings. If they invest in the wrong loans, in bad loans, it means a destruction of the principal, which cannot be reinvested into any other project or cannot be lent out to anybody else. So it also comes at the cost of economic growth. Uh, last, uh, one positive note, I think uh, with my experience in Europe, we see that a lot of uh, state, we see a lot of state ownership of land, which in many cases had, has led to a uh, artificial a scarcity of land which pushes up housing prices in the Netherlands for instance a lot of uh, a lot of cities are completely dependent upon the revenues they earn uh, of selling land and they basically work as uh, monopolists uh, uh, trying to uh, 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 trying to sell land at monopoly prices uh, and that's the way a lot of cities uh, get revenue uh, but the one positive thing or one of the most positive things I've seen in, in Guatemala is that most land is actually in private hands. So it's very unlikely that there will be artificial scarcity of land, uh, uh, which then might reduce housing affordability and might reduce housing supply. So in some main problems, we have this obsession with subsidies, this obsession of, with loan guarantees, and at the same time, licenses and zoning laws reduce housing affordability and reduce housing supply, leading to higher prices and, and also higher rental prices for a lot of Guatemalans. And therefore, uh, I think a, a very difficult situation for the poorer and the most vulnerable uh, levels of the Guatemalan society. So thank you very much. And uh, let's have a, a dialogue and conversation. Thank you very much, Olaf. Uh, we're going to go into the Q&A segment now. Give us your questions at the Facebook page of the Centro Henry Hazlitt, the Henry Hazlitt Center. We, we're looking forward to your questions. I'm going to start with a question. Um, uh, the, the time that we're living, um, we're always dealing with uh, different crises. And the current crisis that we're dealing with is, is obviously the COVID crisis. And each crisis somehow uh, turns the market or the availability of certain products uh, a little bit on, on its head. In this case, um, the question is for both of you. Um, do you see a big change in terms of housing dynamics, what the uh, renters, what the uh, home purchasers will be looking for uh, compared to pre-COVID time and uh, post-COVID time? What, what, where do you see the major changes in, in this dynamic? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to jump in on this. I, I think right now the, the challenge is there's an incredible amount of uncertainty. Um, and as a rule, I think in general, when you have this level of uncertainty, I think you want a lot of flexibility for the market to respond. Um, we don't necessarily know how, this is, how the preferences are going to play out. I think there are a lot of smart guesses. So I think that, you know, as more people start to work remotely on the margins, you know, some people might want to move out of congested cities where housing prices are higher. Um, at the same point, as more people get the freedom to work remotely, they might, want, they might want to move into cities where there are really high consumption amenities, right? So if I live in New York and the coronavirus is over, I can go to Broadway, I can go to some of the best, you know, restaurants and bars in the world. Um, and so if I'm free from having to go into the office every day, I might actually want to move to New York. And so we don't know how all that's going to shake out. And it's the same thing with how many companies are going to work remotely. You know, beyond housing, um, we don't really know what's going to happen with office rents, right? A lot of companies might just stop leasing out office space. Um, and the best way to use that, you know, unused office space might be to turn it into residential or might be to turn it into some other uh, potential use. Of course, warehouses, right? So here in the U.S., uh, distribution and warehouse space, there's an incredible amount of demand for it. That might be the appropriate use. And so the really important thing from where I'm standing is to make sure that markets have the flexibility to respond and to experiment and to test the market and to see how preferences are actually changing. And the more we can do that rather than the more we can say, oh, well, this is how preferences are changing. This is how we should change uh, regulation. I think we're going to get a more positive outcome. Uh, 
Excellent. Olaf. You know, one of the changes you see in Guatemala, at least, is with the residential buildings, especially, is that a lot of uh, higher higher quality housing units would have a lot of amenities, no? Like gyms, uh, swimming pools, uh, uh, social uh, spaces, and uh, uh, even co uh, co-working spaces. I think a lot of people are reconsidering how how useful it is to pay probably 100, 200, 300, or even more dollars per month for all these amenities when they can not even use them with the virus. So the first question is probably how long will the virus affect these kind of uh, opal, open communal spaces in Guatemala? And we have to recognize that most units have been becoming smaller over, over the time. Probably we've seen something similar in New York, but in um, more, uh, uh, maybe in the past, no? But it, the current tendency in Guatemala, because the square meter price is pretty high right now, is a reduction of the total size of the of, of apartments or offices. So instead of having a, a, an apartment of 200 square meters, we're going to apartments of 60, 50, even 40 square meters, just because of housing affordability and because the square meter price has gone up. Well, how livable is a 40 square meter apartment when there's no amenities. So it's uh, it's really, uh, uh, I think it, it will bring some changes in, in, in Guatemala, especially from the buyer's viewpoint. And even in, 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 in developed markets, some of the same, same tendencies might might occur. No? So, but it's the, that's the main impact I'm seeing in short, in short term. Maybe medium, long term, we'll see uh, uh, other changes, no? especially uh, as uh, Nolan mentioned, how many people are willing to uh, live in congested cities and how many will uh, will uh, will start working virtually and, and from a distance? In, in the in the case of Guatemala, uh, we were seeing uh, an incredible migration back towards the city in apartments. Uh, you mentioned uh, Olaf, and, and and I'm sure this is a similar case to New York. Um, however, since people are now able to work from home, or at least uh, in these few months, we've seen this dynamic. Uh, do you see people moving back out uh, to the suburbs, uh, looking for more space where they can um, do more activities with their families? Uh, or, or do you think that there might be a continuation of a movement towards the city uh, in these smaller units? Well, in, in Guatemala, at least, uh, most people that, that can afford to go to come back to more centric zones are, are especially uh, people with, with a little bit more money. No? So in, in those cases, they could probably afford having two housing units, one further away from the city with more space, with a garden, etc., cetera, and, and later one in the city, maybe a rental unit, or maybe they, they purchase a unit which is closer to work, which, uh, which allows to, uh, to, to cope with traffic jams. No? However, the, the poor uh, uh, Guatemalans, the, the, the ones who are really pushing the, the urbanization of, of Guatemala do not have that economic capacity. So most likely they will have to continue uh, uh, commute for two or three hours uh, mm -hmm. or maybe four or five, six hours a day, and they don't really have the potential, the economic capacity to purchase housing units, even in neighborhoods that aren't seen as uh, as, as positive as the, the prime uh, zones of Guatemala City. So we've seen a, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, housing units built in, in other zones, zone five, maybe zone two, maybe zone 12, but they failed because simply the, the monthly a mortgage payment is too high for the segments they're aiming for. So uh, those segments uh, are, it's going to be impossible for those segments to pay up uh, one, 800 or 1,000 or 1,200 mortgage payment a month. And, and therefore they're basically, uh, uh, they're basically, uh, uh, they're basically forced to live further away. And therefore the commute will always be there and they won't be able to, to work from uh, on a distance. Uh, we, we have a question from two viewers uh, that is, is along the same lines. One of them is Pedro Pablo Velasquez and the other is Catalina Hall. And both of them are asking a question with regards to uh, with prices in New York City being astronomical, astronomical why, doesn't, uh, why doesn't the government allow for more housing to, to uh, to be uh, built. Uh, why are they limiting uh, supply? Uh, 
Yeah, it's a great question. It's it's a multifaceted answer. Uh, you know, on the one hand, people who already live uh, in a certain area, um, they don't want to deal with the negative externalities associated with new people coming in. Uh, so especially if the government can't, you know, manage traffic or can't add new park space or open space or can't expand schools, new people might present a burden on public services. Um, and so this is really a governance problem um, that the local government needs to be better at dealing with. Uh, but instead, the way that most cities solve these problems is by just not letting new people come in. Mm -hmm. the, the second sort of major factor here is that if you're a current property owner, so let's say you're a homeowner uh, or you know, a, uh, an investor, um, if you hold property uh, and demand is high and rising, um, it's purely to your benefit to prevent new supply from being added. Um, the value of your asset is going to keep going up. Mm -hmm. And so you know, it's hard to disentangle how much of this is people who are worried about the impacts or people who sort of on some level recognize that it's to their benefit to perpetuate housing scarcity. Um, but I think it's probably a mix of both. If you are a New York City brownstone owner and you bought your property in the 1980s, you've seen incredible increases in wealth. Um, and there's really no incentive for you to disrupt that by allowing for new housing to come in. Okay, we have, uh, we have five more minutes. So uh, I guess we have time for two more questions. Um, Kat, uh, Daniela Lowe uh, asks, why do housing prices in the U.S. change so drastically from one state to another? That's a great question. Um, if you find the answer, you should write a paper and collect your uh, Nobel Prize in economics. <laughs> um, the, the, the less facetious answer is New York, the U.S., unlike most um, you know, Western countries, has a highly decentralized system of land use regulation, uh, number one. So in the US, it's almost exclusively local governments that write zoning and write land use regulations. Um, and so a lot of stuff influences that, some of it's political culture. So in a place like Texas, they're much more favorable to property rights and they're much more favorable to economic freedom. And so they have much uh, less strict standards on you know where and what they're gonna allow to be built. Of course, they, they enforce basic building health and safety just as much as any other place, but they don't arbitrarily limit the amount of housing. As, to a place, as opposed to a place like California uh, or New York, where there are much, much, much more restrictions on the book. Um, another element of this is, is variation in, in, in wealth, right? So a place like Silicon Valley is really one of the wealthiest places in the world. Um, you know, there's incredible wealth being created in Silicon Valley or in Midtown Manhattan. Um, and so that translates into really, really high demand for housing. And so these places that are incredibly wealthy hit the limits of what the zoning will allow very quickly, and then they start seeing uh, housing costs go up. I even just to add, maybe you can even see like a, a competition between cities. No, I think maybe Nolan can tell us a little bit more, but Silicon Valley has a problem with housing affordability, also with office space. And you see a lot of uh, people and investment going actually I think to Florida, which is booming right now. So you see actually how housing affordability reduces uh, the competitiveness of a city in an uh, international context and that uh, uh, having uh, very expensive housing and very expensive office units might reduce the willingness of outside investors to come in and keep on investing. So you see other cities popping up as alternatives that then uh, get a part of the, the demand created by those type of investments. No? Okay, we have a final Spider-Man question. This is from William Arriaga. He says, there's a game of Spider-Man where Peter is a student who works with Dr. Octopus. He doesn't get paid, he can't pay rent, and consequently, he becomes homeless. Is this a more realistic Spider-Man? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, I appreciate the question. Yes, I, I also played the PlayStation 4 game. Um, not just as not just as research for this presentation. Um, you know, I, I mean, he in every rendition of the character, he struggles with rent um, and getting evicted is kind of the extreme scenario. Uh, I don't know that he gets evicted in most renditions of the character. Um, but, you know, it, the PS4, Sp Peter Parker is dealing with the same kinds of pressures that um, the Sam Raimi, Sam Raimi early 2000s trilogy is dealing with. I mean, he. You know, in the in the movies that I talk about, he, he's watching his aunt get evicted um, and then he is barely making rent on his own. Um, and it's kind of interesting because, you know, we have another video where we talk about the evil developer or the evil landlord. 
Um, very rarely are landlords or developers portrayed very sympathetically. Uh, but something I actually found kind of interesting is that in Spider-Man 2, he doesn't get evicted purely because his landlord is kind of sympathetic to his situation. Um, and so in that sense, it's a very nuanced sort of picture of, you know, the sort of not very black and white nature of housing politics. Um, you know, uh, you might have a, a, a landlord who's not sympathetic and not helpful and evicts you, as in the PS4 uh, game, or, you know, you might have somebody who helps you out. It's it's complicated. And there's there's an incredible human and personal element to housing, which I think makes it uh, doubly uh, difficult to deal with as a policy area. Excellent. Well, right on time. Um, thank you very much, Olin. Thank you very much, Olaf. And in the name of the Henry Hazlitt Center, we thank you for attending the UFM talk, Could Spider-Man Afford to Live in New York? Please join us next Monday at 3 p.m. for our next conference, Como Ponemos a Dieta al Estado Luego de la Pandemia, with Gabriel Calzada, UFM President, and Javier Fernandez Laschetti, a counselor of Treasury Madrid and former UFM Vice President. Thank you very much for attending this UFM talk and have a good night. Hoy, el mundo busca cursos en línea. Hoy, el mundo sigue las tendencias del mercado. Hoy, el mundo necesita emprendedores. Hoy más que nunca, el conocimiento se dispersó y la Universidad Francisco Marroquín no cerró. Se multiplicó en diversos hogares.